¿sí? Bien, vamos a empezar entonces con la segunda charla del día. We're about to begin with the second talk of the day. Uh, this, will be, this talk will be delivered by Matías Sañartu from Universidad Técnica Federico Santa María in Chile. Okay? Uh, Matías Sañartu is an associate professor in the Department of Electronic Engineering at Universidad Técnica Federico Santa María in Valparaíso, Chile, and director of the Advanced Center for Electrical and Electronic Engineering from the same institution where he also leads the biomedical engineering research and development. He received his PhD and MS degree in electrical and computer engineering from Purdue University in West Lafayette, USA. His interests are centered on the development of digital signal processing, system modeling, and biomedical engineering tools that involve speech, hearing, and acoustics. His research efforts have revolved around developing quantitative models of human voice production and applying these physiological descriptions for the development of clinical technologies. Dr. Sanyatu has more than uh, 50 uh, publications indexed in Web of Science, 150, more than 150 presentations and international conference, and four PCT patents. And he also serves as an associate editor for both IEEE Transactions on Neural System and Rehabilitation Engineering and the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. He is a member of the Technical Committee on Speech Communication of the Acoustical Society of America, a Fulbright Fellow and IEEE Senior Member. Dr. Sanyarzu, Sanyartu is also co-founder of LANEC SPA, a tech company dedicated to the development of biomedical devices that has received various awards, for instance, Corfo, I, I, IE, and Avoni, and uh, also public and private funding. Okay, so I will uh, present now Matias Añardu for this second talk. Thank you very much, Matias, for being here with us, and I hope you will enjoy your talk. Thank you, Marcelo. Okay. So um, thanks for having me here. It's uh, such an honor to be here, and uh, it's it's been wonderful so far. And I love the place, and it's been very exciting to hear all the talks. And I hope uh, you like what I'm going to show you because I was we were debating with Gabriel when I was thinking about this presentation what to show because we do a lot of different things, and instead of going deep in one topic, we decided as we were discussing, to have a broad scope of different things. So I'm going to show you a lot of stuff and in a very shallow way, right? So we decided that was the best way to open the floor for discussions, and we can go deep into the questions if you have one particular topic that you like, and we can go deep. Now, the good thing, though, is that Gabriel is going to talk about some of our joint work after this, and so is Victor. So you will get to hear some of the stuff. And I have two PhD students here that can fill in all the details for some of the uh, points. So we'll get to go deep if that's the case. So let me start with this, the Advanced Center for Electrical and Electronic Engineering um, that stands for AC Triple AC Three E. Uh, that's that's the three E's. This place, um, it's been around. It, it involves. Uh, it, it is at Santa Maria and but it, it also involves eight other universities. This is a group of 37 researchers, 15 postdoc, more than 200 students. And I have the lucky to be the director of this operation. And we recently moved to a new building. Uh, this is located on campus. So hopefully this would be the first meeting. Um, it was supposed to be the first meeting for the Stick and Suit project, but it didn't work out. So hopefully we'll be the second meeting at some point on campus in Santa Maria, which is in Valparaiso. These are some of the pictures so you can have an idea. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful campus with right on the cliff with a beautiful ocean view. Uh, if you have any questions, Ivan can explain you the details. Um, it's very, it's very pretty and it's a pretty perfect place for, for getting together and having these profound discussions about science. We're located about a block from the main campus. Um, 
and this new building, and it has also pretty good view. I, I have to take a picture of myself so you can see that this is the reality, right? That's the view we have from the lab, which is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. But it's a great place. It has, it's brand new. We've been here for about a year. They had all sorts of lab space, office spaces. The students get to use uh, open design for the offices. These new uh, places for um, getting together, places for workshops, lab spaces and benchmarks, uh, acoustic recordings, and we do all sorts of things, uh, it, given that this is not just biomedical, it's electrical in general. We also have robotics, we have electromobility and artificial intelligence applied to hardware and so on. So we, we fabricate our own electronics in-house. In it's, a, it's a fantastic place. And we also do a lot of outreach. So we have visitors. These are actually my kids. That's Nicolás, Julieta, and Mabel. So they really like it's a it's a place where even kids think it's fun, which is that I think that's a life accomplishment. When your kids think you're doing something fun, that's great. It's a great feeling. So so it's it's a it's a very fun place and we do very cool stuff. So this is a snapshot of what we have done in the eight years we have as a center. We have about 700 papers. More than 12,000 citations for those 700 papers. We have graduated about 700 students, a good number of doctors. We have a good number of patents that have been granted, uh, and so on. But I think the key thing, I think we are 37. Of the 37, 31 of those 37 people are actually associate editors in IEEE or ASA and so on. Uh, journal, so so they're well uh, regarded as as top researchers, and the key thing is that this center receives funding from the government to do research in a long time window. So this is a ten year grant that it's renewable for another ten, and then for another ten, and you have to bring some private funding, private or international funding. So the the numbers that are really outstanding are these. So we have more than 12, 14 million US dollars as funding, depending on the rate, I used to say it was 20, right? But it's now it's 14. It's the same amount of Chilean pesos, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, we have 2 million uh, so far from uh, NIH and other grants from, the, from, from international agencies, and about 3 million from Chilean companies. They have put money into our research. So this is really outstanding for the Chilean scenario. So we are like an example of how centers should try to connect with industry. So it's a, it's a great place and I'm very happy to be the director of this operation. But let me, let me start, given that I wanna talk about very broadly to hopefully open some connections for you. Um, I'm gonna start with the research line within the center that does biomedical engineering. So as a group, we aim to assist diagnosis and treatment using the tools we, we use as electrical and electronic engineering by focusing on developing devices, modeling, and analysis of signals and systems. I'm the PI of this research line along with Pamela Guevara, and we have four other researchers in the area Feinstein, Oreo, Delano, and Elderedi. And we have six postdocs working in our group. So what we do in a snapshot is this. Um, we focus on four topics. Neural and rehabilitation engineering is one of the key topics we work. Biomed biomedical signals, sensors, and devices is the other one. Biomedical data analytics and physiological modeling. So these are the topics we work on. Just to give you an idea of what others do, and because I'll, I'll be talking about voice in a minute, but before we get there, uh, Pamela works in this idea of um, uh, connections in the like neural wiring in the brain. So she uses a technique called uh, diffusion MRI to, to get idea of the fiber bundles and how these connections 
are, are identified. So she does all sorts of clustering based on MRI and her technique. She uses these clustering, and based on the clustering, she's able to uh, predict connectivity in the brain. So, so brain function and how this area is connected to this area. And she, she does all sorts of um, ideas to identify the, the connections. And she's been looking into this uh, in normal subjects as well as some, some pathological cases. For instance, here, multiple sclerosis. In her collaboration with uh, our researcher, Patricio Orio, Patricio Orio is into modeling of, of neural systems using something called neural mass models. And using neural mass models, they have been able to create a dynamic model of the brain using the, the information of the connections, the connectum. And with that, they have been able to predict and mimic some EEG-like and bowl-like signals <laughs> so with this, they have a model that it's capable of pro producing and predicting some behavior of, of what we see in the lab in actual recordings. Um, this is taking the group to another set of problems where they look at neurostimulation, neurostimulating either with ultrasound, uh, vibratory, and so on. And they, they, they're very interested, and this is Wailen Deredi, well, by the way, was a full professor in Manchester University. And was, he fell in love with the Chilean wine and a Chilean lady. And that was actually a way to recruit people. He, was, he moved to Chile, and he's now a faculty member uh, at the Senate in Valparaiso. So he, is, he, he does modeling of large-scale brain network for neurostimulation, and they model using the previous descriptions how the brain operates and how certain uh, stimulation in one area can affect other areas of the brain. This was done in, in this idea of stimulating neural behavior. And they have this, we call it the triad of network oscillation and behavior. So, so they study the idea of stimulate the system and see if that changes behavior. And this is called neurostimulation, and we had a project or neuromodulation. Neuromodulation is a type of stimulation where you change behavior by stimulating a particular band. So, for instance, if you want to stay focused, you stimulate a particular band that could help you to reach that and have that behavior. And, and you, we tested this in a project funded by a copper mining company <laughs> where the idea was to test. Uh, a cognitive loading assessment and performance in high altitude, so with the lack of oxygen. So you tend to do pretty bad under the, you know, reduced amount of oxygen. And they were able to demonstrate that if you excite the neural system, essentially wearing a simple device like this, you can have a frequency of 20, 23 hertz, which was stimulating a particular bandwidth but for, or for a particular band, and with that, your performance and your cognitive test got better. This is what neuromodulation says, and we were able to test it out. And the idea was to have something that was an, a tool to assist the performance in certain tasks. There are have to certain decision making that happens in the mining industry in high altitude, like operating certain vehicles and so on. <laughs> So this was done um, a few years back, and we were doing sort of in-field testing and also mimicking in the lab the conditions with the lack of oxygen. This is a brand new toy called iCub. It's a robot for cognitive robotics, which is an Italian design used to control a robot using neuroscience principles. Uh, so motor learning and, and the, the things that it's associated to this robot are quite unique. Uh, it has 3,000 sensors and 53 motors associated with the control of this uh, particular, it's meant to be a kid, like a six-year-old kid, that it's learning to do things. So it learns how to recognize something by touching the device or by seeing something or by hearing something. 
and it's learning, but it's all about what we know of learning in neuroscience. It's a really cool project that aims to bridge gap between robotics and neuroscience. This came to the lab less than a year ago, and we, we're running some experiments where the robot is learning to walk. And I'll be telling you that I'm also doing some stuff with this, with this robot. There's also biomedical analysis. Uh, this is for by emotion analysis. We've done that. Some of this analysis became part of the of this company that Marcelo was saying at the beginning, Blanek. Um, there's another company doing biomedical, which is also a startup from a researcher in the center called Symbiotica, and they do screening of the eardrum. We've done uh, automatic lip reading and so on. So there's a number of capabilities in the center to do these things. Uh, creating, this was a, it's a feed bottle that we needed to know exactly the amount of pressure that a newborn in an incubator was actually sucking so that you can estimate whether the, it was ready to go and ready to leave the incubator. So that was designed for that purpose. We've done some assistive tech and we also done some emergency ventilation during the pandemic. So, oh, and the last one of these uh, examples is the work of Paul, who's working on identifying certain properties in, in tinnitus. <laughs> he's looking at, uh, his, his idea is that, that this ear problem is really a neuroscience problem. It's actually a psychological problem rather than a problem in your ear. Uh, so he's looking at the problem in a different perspective. So he's running uh, behavioral experiments with people and trying to identify certain the role of certain components of the nucleus in the in the auditory process. It's a really new project, so there's not a lot to say at this point. <coughs> so that's the context of the center, the group. And let me tell you about my, my, my lab in particular, the voice production lab or VP lab. We do a lot of modeling. Um, these are real vocal folds that we measure in the lab using high-speed video cameras. These are synthetic vocal folds that are also measured with high-speed video camera. And these are good representations of what we see here. And we also have these numerical models that are also good representations. And so we do modeling, image signal processing, video processing of various things. And I'll tell you some about that. Um, so let me start with what we have in the lab. So we have these chambers where we can do recordings. And I'm very proud of this because I designed some of this. So it's, I think it's fantastic. Um, this is like a studio, like a recording studio, but with a medical flavor. So it has this large uh, windows where you can see what's happening inside. Uh, they're acoustically isolated, but also electromagnetically isolated. Uh, and they're operated from the outside. When, when we do experiments for high-speed video, that's the high-speed video camera. It records up to 480,000 frames per second. So that's almost half a million frames per second. Uh, we don't use it all the way up to that point. We typically record with 10,000 10, frames per second. Uh, so the, the, this, this would be the ENT, the doctor who's running the experiments, we are not allowed to do that because we're engineers. Um, and they have support from, from our engineering staff. So that's sort of the idea of what's happening inside. We've done it before, this is before the pandemic. Um, so, and some of the things we do uh, also can be done with airflow at the same time with video, which is part of, a, it's an important part of what Gabriel is gonna be talking about. So in order to do that, we have to modify some of the equipment. If you can see below, there's a mask here. That would be the Rothenberg mask. And we created the support in order to put the endoscope at the same time without leaking too much air. So we can record airflow and high-speed video simultaneously. We also do neuroscience and some EEG experiments. We have a biosemi of 128 channels. There you go, I was, I was hoping to tell you that. Um, 
And we've done all sorts of experiments. Some are auditory, some others are visual. Uh, and this is in a separate chamber that it's exactly next door to the other one. You also have an anechoic chamber to do like more uh, testing or certification of some equipment. So this is in a separate building. But we, we get to run some experiments there. It's pretty large. It's like this, this big of this space right here. So yeah, so we have uh, aerodynamic equipment. We have acoustic equipment with microphones. We have EGG, electroglottography. We have sound meters. Uh, this is something that I'm very proud of, which is very unique. That's an endoscope that in the working channel, in the working channel, we added a laser grid. So, so we can project, as we see the vocal folds, we can project a laser grid like this. So we can actually measure the physical dimensions of where we're, where we're, uh, we're looking at, which is quite hard when you do medical imaging. You don't know exactly the dimensions of the things you're seeing. One of the latest, oh, then that's the camera. This is one of the latest equipment. It's a surface EAG, EMG, with 64 channels. It's a, it's a high density EMG uh, channel, and that's for one of the, our newest PhD students who's running this experiment, which is actually this person, that's the student. And we're running this idea of estimating surface, and I'll tell you a bit about that at the end of this talk. So, um, yesterday I asked, Juliana about ambulatory voice monitoring. This is something that we've been doing for a number of years. This was my dissertation in 2010. And this is something that we developed as a tool that was connected to a smartphone, an accelerometer that goes into your neck and allows you to record skin vibration, skin acceleration, for hours and hours and hours, eight hours a day, three weeks, uh, and we've done that with 600 people. It's a lot of data, and these are recorded at more than 10,000, uh, I think it's 11, uh, 11K as a sampling rate. So we started with this in 2011, and it became something that was very promising. We're still learning how to analyze all this data. We've done machine learning, we've done typical statistical analysis. We've done all sorts of different things. Um, there's a lot of learning that needs to happen. And this is, by the way, an invitation to look at this new type of signal, which is a neck surface acceleration. And we're still figuring out. I mean, we're, we're, I can show you what, we, what we've done, and, and Victor will tell you more about this. It, this be, became his dissertation. And we realized that this was an excellent tool for the clinical work, so we thought we might as well have something to actually put it in the, in the clinical field. So we developed this tool called the Advanced Voice Monitor, and it became this thing here, which has now, it doesn't need the phone, so it's self-contained. It has a battery, recording, and a, a lot of different things that can still connect to your phone to send you messages and so on. But it's a self-contained design, and we decided to create a company to be able to move this thing into the field. Um, we haven't yet finished that because we've still refining the design. The latest thing is this. Now it's a flexible, it's a flexible design. It's a very comfortable, very lightweight. So we, this is the one that we are starting to sell. And this became the company that, that I started with Alejandro. And now it's run by the students, the former students in our group. And I'm involved as a technical or senior advisor. Things that we do with this signal. Um, in my dissertation, I created this thing called subglottal inverse filtering, which is a, we want to get an estimate of the glottal flow signal. But we're going to do it not with a microphone, but with the neck surface acceleration signal. The, there's a number of things that are good about that. And one of them is privacy. Um, there's less of a resonance, right? So you don't have these crazy formants moving all over the place. This is a steady subglottal resonance that you need to identify and cancel out. Uh, and, and it's non-intelligible, so 
that's why the privacy it's better so it's not like having a microphone so you can actually do it uh, across time and and you can have these things so our one of the first things we did was classifying uh, and using information to get that and and Bob Hillman which is one of our collaborators he was part of my PhD thesis committee um, wanted to get aerodynamic parameters AC flow MFDR those those things uh, he wanted to have that across the day because they, they, when they go to the clinic, a patient go to the, goes to the clinic, they typically record with the Rothenberg mask and they ask them to say sustain vowel ah or say pa, 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 pa. And they get all sorts of analysis and say, oh, you have this or you have that. Or you're recovering well or you're not recovering well. But as you can imagine, it's only a snapshot of a moment. And it's very common when you go to the doctor, the minute the doctor says cough or do something, you know that you're doing it wrong. It's not the way it used to be 10 minutes ago. Something happens, you either get nervous or I don't know what psychological thing may happen. But in voice, it's fairly common to have a different behavior in a short term window. So that's why uh, having aerodynamic parameters in the long term window is important. So we developed this thing. Uh, it became the subglottal inverse filtering. And we demonstrated that you can use it to improve the classification just by looking at the data and using essentially uh, support vector machine classification that you can do about 85% of accuracy in classifying normals and patients. But there's a lot of uncertainty. This is why I think there's plenty of room for improvement because you can see there's a lot of phonotraumatic people. These are patients, they're behaving like normal people. And these are normal people, they're behaving like patients, which means that your voice the way you use your voice doesn't really tell you everything but it's so it's very interesting we need to learn a lot about what is wrong in your voice usage and and how to identify that one piece of that information of the day rather than looking at the whole data so it's a very interesting and we have tried other things this is a uh umap approach to look at the data differently so we've done a number of things Moving on onto the idea of connecting models with data. When Gabriel started working with us, um, I had this idea that I wanted to have a model of the glottis that was like a triangle, like a body cover model, but in a triangular shape, which was similar to what we typically see in high-speed videos. And Gabriel helped us to create a way to uh, control the model, which had already existed i mean we created that in 2017 but we wanted to control the model with all five intrinsic muscles so we did that with gabriel and was published this year and it's a great tool that we have used for a number of things this is an example of what we've used the model for uh, in this example this is an inverse problem essentially what we want to estimate are subglottal pressure um, you know, AC flow, MFDR, those things. But we also want to estimate uh, your muscle activity. This is when the, the clinicians we work with said, we would love to know how much effort you're putting, so your subglottal pressure. We would love to know whether your larynx is tense or not uh, in the way you're using your voice. So they wanted to know certain inputs of our model. So in order to do that, we created this solution as an inverse problem uh, where now the idea was to get an estimate of subglottal pressure, contact pressure, how strong the vocal folds are colliding to each other, uh, and muscle activation. This is uh, TA muscle activation and CT muscle activation. So in order to do that, what we did is we trained, we trained a network by running this model many 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 times thousands of times and we train and when we got as these are our inputs and these are the outputs the flow the subglottal pressure the contact pressure and we use that info uh to create a network that would take some of this info in in forms of not a waveform but features of the waveform and and the network was trained so that it will give you these outputs based on these inputs. And we validated that against 
clinical data. So it was not, everything was trained using the model, but it was validating against clinical data. That was a high complexity problem, but because you, if you use only the model info, you will get a different architecture and different uh, way of thinking about this network. In fact, the network is actually very simple because it was the best fit for the clinical data. Uh, so that's something where we use the model for. And I don't know if you, uh, you're not gonna talk about this, Gaudin, right? Yeah, so Gaudin is probably gonna talk about this other way. This is how we initially thought of the problem, which is a Bayesian framework, Kalman filtering approach, uh, where you bring the subject, this handsome gentleman here, you bring this person to the lab, you go do all sorts of crazy recordings with this person. So you create a model of the person. You fit the model, not to just one signal, but all sorts of conditions, all sorts of signals. And you do the best you can in estimating that person's behavior. And once you have the model, then you have simple observations like the next surface acceleration, <coughs> and you get measures that are difficult to estimate. So this is what we did with Gabriel in 2020. Um, we took all these measurements, and from these measurements, uh, we used the area of the high-speed video. It's a calibrated high-speed video, so we were able to get areas in square centimeters. And the glottal airflow from the Rothenberg mask. And the idea was to estimate the subglottal pressure. So the exercise we used was a pa, 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 where, you know, in between piece, right? If you interpolate that, you're going to get the pressure you're using to phonate that sustained vowel. So essentially, you interpolate these points, and that's the pressure you'll have when you're saying this particular sound. So the idea was to estimate the same thing without knowing this signal here uh, with the idea of estimating subglottal pressure directly uh, from the accelerometer without having to say pa 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 so you can estimate that throughout the day and this is our validation we tried two models and i'm showing you the beautiful one uh, there's a, a horrible one that i purposely erased of this picture um, and we needed to use two signals to get that performance, both glottal area and glottal flow. Amido is now working on using only flow, which is only the accelerometer to do the same task. Um, but the beautiful thing is that it shows that you can get not only your estimate, but your confidence intervals. This is why the Bayesian framework is useful, because it gives you not only an answer, but how good or bad your answer is. So that's the part that we like a lot about this uh, problem. Emito is now working on a constrained version of this. When you add additional information, it could be from a different recording. And now uh, you can only use uh, the flow <coughs> and not just flow and mask, right? If you only use the flow, you can use the accelerometer as your only input. And then we can run this. So the problem with this, and the reason why we went to the neural network, uh, it's because this is very computational and expensive. Whereas the other one, you can run it in real time. It's very inexpensive. When the, once the network is trained, it's only just a simple multiplication of factors, and you can run it real time. Uh, but we're trying the approach uh, from different angles. To continue. High-speed video is a really cool tool. And one of the things we wanted to estimate was the contact. So how strong the contact is between the vocal folds, because that's supposed to be one of the factors that leads to the development of nodules. When you have nodules, it's typically thought because you're putting too much air, and that essentially produces too much collision in your vocal folds. So we wanted to estimate that, but it's very hard to measure that. In, in collaboration with Harvard Medical School, which is part of our grant, we have an NIH grant with them. 
um, we developed this thing that you can barely see here, but there's a sensor there. There's a piece of metal that goes into the vocal folds. It's actually measuring contact pressure. Is it disgusting? Yes. Is it dangerous? Yes. So this is not something you're supposed to do. We were allowed to do it in a patient with cancer that had one of the vocal folds removed. So it was attached to the other left, to the left without vocal folds. So there's less risk of destroying one of the vocal folds by doing this experiment. This was done by Steven Seitel, which is a highly regarded uh, surgeon in Harvard. And so we use our technique. We develop a technique based on Kalman filtering, where we use uh, the deformation of elastic bodies. So Hertz contact, if you're familiar with that, uh, it's like bouncing a, a ball. And you can predict the force, the bouncing force, by looking at the deformation of the body. Uh, so we did that, and we needed to estimate the apparent overlap between the vocal folds. By estimating the apparent overlap, you estimate the deformation and therefore the force and the pressure. <laughs> and oh, can you see the video? I don't know if you can see it, but in red is one of the folds. It's not moving because there's no vocal fold. And in blue is the one that it's moving. It's detecting the edge, and it's detecting the deformation, and it gave us a pretty good match between what the sensor was capturing and whether our technique was detecting as the maximum point of contact. So we've done that, and we've done other things in terms of video analysis. We created, an, I don't know if you're familiar with the photo, a phonovibrogram, or the digital chemograph. Are you, are you familiar with those things? These are things that people in high-speed video analysis do to look at a waveform of the video. So you cut the video in a slice like this, you put it in the upward direction, and you look, you, can look, you look at the edge of the vocal folds as a time-bearing thing. So you create a waveform out of the edge of one position. This is used in, in clinic, uh, and we created a thing that creates a, a description of the whole edge and these are the statistics. This is the, actually the PDF of the vocal edge. So we created a different way to look at the thing. And these are average descriptions of the vocal fold edge. So that's a conditional probability or a given area of, of the distribution. So we're looking at the problem of video analysis from a probabilistic way. Uh, and that helps a lot to get an idea of what is actually happening. Because you have a lot of data. High-speed video provides a lot of data, but it's hard to interpret what's happening with the data. This is like the, the next surface acceleration. This new data, and, and what is the best way to look at the data? We're still learning how to do that. So we developed that, and we created this thing where um, you can look at the asymmetry of the vocal folds from an anterior-posterior fashion. So it's a different way of thinking about the whole movement of the vocal folds. And that was used because now we are developing, and this is the work of Jesus, we're now developing an asymmetric version of the triangular body cover model. And the asymmetric version of the bo triangular body cover model, we want to know whether we can mimic some of the recordings we have seen for patients with paralysis, patients with uh, muscle tension dysphonia. And so we now have a version that it's capable of having different left and right vocal folds. And, and Jesus had to work out all the contact mechanics, which were different when you have asymmetric behavior. And we're looking at all the properties in order to mimic what we want. So we're now in the phase of comparing what the model predicts and what the data says. And this is an example. This is with vocal fold paralysis. This is what you would see in a chymogram. So this is the same idea that I was explaining. You cut and a line, and then you look at the line across time, you would see these behaviors that in red is uh, the left, and in blue is the right vocal fold for unilateral vocal fold paralysis, and this is for muscle tension dysphonia. And you can see that they're not symmetric, and there is asymmetry both in phase and in amplitude. So Jesus was mimicking uh, parameters in order to imitate as a first approximation these behaviors, and you would see that in terms of amplitude asymmetry, the
The video says 68% of asymmetry and 36% of face asymmetry, and we're getting 32 and 49. So we still need to work on polishing this a bit better to, to identify exactly what's happening. But this is a new way of thinking about these models because this is asymmetric, but with, thanks to Gabriel, essentially five muscles. So it's not a factor that says your vocal fold is half of the other vocal fold. This is controlling five different muscles. So we can imitate what happens if you get paralysis in these two muscles or in this one muscle. So you can, you can start playing with this. So it becomes really difficult because you have way too many parameters, but this is what we think we need to be looking at. So anyway, so we're getting, we're getting closer. We still need to learn certain differences, but we now have a tool that can help us to get there. And now a couple of new things. Um, this is now a new model that uh, it's been, it was submitted a couple of weeks ago with Gabriel, where, uh, with a friend in Waterloo in Canada and his PhD student, Mohamed Seri. We developed this idea or well, well, we developed, they developed, I was just helping a bit, uh, a, a version of the model where you have now extrinsic muscles. This is fairly new because uh, most of what we've done is intrinsic muscles, but the outside muscles in the neck are very large. So if you can get an idea of what these muscles do, you can get a very good idea of how to model uh, muscle tension dysphonia that affects both internal and external muscles. Um, and we've done some, in the past, we developed something called the viscous contact model, which was helping us to estimate contact, uh, thinking of the vocal folds as essentially fluid uh, that was moving when you were contacting, the fluid was moving from one direction to another. And in 2007, we published this where we were able to predict essentially the behavior that we were seeing in some other papers. We took this idea to the further point and we're currently re developing a model that can predict the effect of swelling. And the point after this is the effect of growing a nodule. So we're developing the, 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 how things change when you grow a nodule inside of the vocal fold. This is, I'm a collaborator here, but this is done primarily at Waterloo. And what they're doing is they, they use finite element and they look at the different stress uh, conditions as you increase swelling. And then we look at the conditions in terms of contact. As you increase the swelling and the development of a nodule, you should be seeing more contact, uh, increased contact pressure, and then you could get into a cycle where it becomes a cascading effect. So this is fairly new. Um, boy, I have way too many stuff. Diva model, this was something we did very recently. It was published this year. Uh, Frank Gunter is a professor at Boston University, and he developed this model that has, uh, it's an articulator model, so it controls the formants in the, in the vocal tract, and the neural process of that. Uh, this model was created in 94, and it's been, been published uh, up until 10 years ago, and he wrote a book about it. It's a big deal, it's a big deal. He's used this model to study stuttering, apresia and, and many voice problems. Uh, so what we did is that this model, the DIVA, which stands for Directions into Velocity of Articulators, uh, we developed a part with the larynx with him. In collaboration with him, we created something called La DIVA. La DIVA and La stands for larynx. The, the original DIVA model, it was only for the vocal truck. Now we added a larynx to this. And the idea is that you have the same Per principles of, of feed forward control and feedback control. And he's done a lot of MRI studies of, of people looking at this. And these are all modules that are related to particular areas in the brain. And so we took the same idea, but we changed essentially the plant that you're controlling. And now it's a larynx, it's not only the tongue. But there's a new biomechanical model, and we added a, one of our initial models for this purpose. And Gabriel was involved in this effort, uh, and we think this, this particular uh, development is, is opens the door of how we think about models, because it now this is not a model that has laryngeal muscle control. It also has the ability of hear the output, hearing the output, and changing the behavior for that. 
we did some developments uh, and compare against some data. So we validated the model. Uh, this is a reflexive paradigm, and this is an adaptive paradigm where we change the um, we change the the way the the peop, the model was hearing itself, and it was compared against data. So black line is real data from from normal subjects, and the different colors represent different conditions of the parameters. So you can get the same behavior if you tune the model uh, properly to mimic the the subject group. Uh, so this is an essentially way that the model is actually what's happening here is that the model is hearing a particular tone, like, ah, uh, and at some point it changes to ah, uh, uh, and you're supposed to do the same steady sound, and you're hearing yourself changing, although you're not doing this, but right? it's a signal processing. In real time, you change the feedback, and you see how that perturbation changes the behavior. So this is what people do when that happens. That's a black line, and the model is actually capable of mimicking the same behavior. And this is the same idea, but in an adaptive fashion. So you slowly start changing the baseline. You change a bit, one hertz, and then another hertz, and then you do it as a ramp. And that way, the model so reconfigure itself, and subjects do the same thing. So this is a validated approach. So this is a brand new track. It's a brand new track for us, and we're currently uh, validating our behavior using EEG. Um, so th these are the form and changes, unperturbed and in red, uh, and with changes in the first format and the or uh, you can change it upward or downward in the first format. And these are the blue and black, and these are the the ERP changes, and these are the source uh, lo location. This is still early. Uh, this picture was taken last week as a preliminary analysis. So this is ongoing effort. But what we're essentially doing is validating that the model not only produces the right behavior, but also uh, is activating those parts in the brain that were supposed to be activated according to the original DIVA model. And the idea after this is to translate this behavior into this guy. So we're going to teach the robot, uh, we're going to program the DIVA model into the ICAP. And the idea is that the robot will learn to speak and it will correct the way of speaking by listening to itself. That's the idea. And the last thing I'm going to show you is this laryngeal. This is brand new. Uh, the equipment uh, was in the lab for the first time about a month ago. Uh, so the idea is to estimate laryngeal activity in order to validate the predictions we have with Gabriel and with Emiro and with Jesus in order to, to validate that the values of the muscles that we're predicting are actually right. We need to have a way of, of measuring that activity. And we can do it with laryngeal EMG, but it's very painful. It's actually extremely painful. It's horrible as an experience. And you're not even allowed to do it in normal or controls because it's very painful. So you would only do it if someone has a paralysis or a medical reason that justifies the type of experiment. So the idea is to do some of the laryngeal experiments in cases where we're allowed to do it and record the signal at the same time. And we're going to connect the two by a decomposition of the, of the firing rate of the two in order to, to do source localization. So this is a new project. It's, it, this is just the idea. The student's just starting. He needs to present his qualifying exam uh, when I get back to Valparais. And that's about it. So just to wrap it up. Uh, I show you a bunch of different things. In Chile, we have a growing system, an ecosystem that it's it's producing these uh, new ideas of how the scientific community could relate with the outside world, with you know people in the states, people in Europe, and with private companies and so on. And there are many opportunities in biomedical engineering, lots of development in voice, but also in biomedical the medical devices itself. And there are several opportunities for researcher, for visiting researchers, for visiting students, for postdocs. There are many opportunities. So, so I'm fascinated to be here to also uh, let you know about these opportunities. So that's, uh, that's that. And, and to finish, I just want to acknowledge the Stikam Sud grant that allowed us to be here, as well as other funding that we have that 
was uh, necessary for the things that I show you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Matthias, for the wonderful talk you just gave us. Um, uh, do you have any question? But before we do have a question from the virtual audience, mm -hmm. you know, um, even though I asked him to be more specific, he didn't reply. But about the time you showed us uh, the pressure sensor implanted on the yes. on the patient, uh, about that time he asked. Is this device developed by dimension researchers and available for public use? What about accuracy based on number of patients? I am not sure if okay. he meant this device. Okay. Uh, the the device I show you, and, and let me see if I have a picture from some other presentation. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Um, where I can show you a bit more uh let's see if i have it here one second but the answer is no it's not available it was a research development uh it's not publicly available it's we're not even allowed to use it very much because it's very restricted to uh the, the this is the device this is how it looks like. I don't know. If... There you go. So this is how it looks. Is it is it also online like this? Yes, almost. But it looks like an endoscope. It looks like an endoscope, and it has in the tip. It has these pressure sensors. So this is a very invasive, and you need to do it with the endoscope. So you're on your left hand or right hand, depending how you do things. Um, you have the endoscope in order to see this. With the other one, you're trying to put the sensor. So it's very complicated, and you are. Yes. Ah, okay. Okay, so now they can see it online. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a very invasive design, but it was meant to do validation. So we're going to be able to record 10 people. So far, we have recorded one. And and these these are recordings that are done in Harvard, the MGH hospital. So they have all the IRB protocols for that. Uh, and it's very hard to get approval for these recordings. So we're going to be able to do only 10. So there's no statistical validity of any kind. These are case studies, essentially, and you only be able to get an idea of whether you get a good match or not. It's the best we can do. Thanks. Here, uh, uh, this person says the one on the neck. So oh. maybe, maybe he meant okay. the, the EMG device. I mean, um, the one of high density, I think. Maybe okay, the high density, the high density, yeah, it's not in this presentation. The high density one, um, that is a commercial device. It's, it's sold by an Italian company called uh, Bio Electronica, I think it's called. Uh, and we are starting to do this, and I have no idea how many patients we're going to be able to record. I'm going to say at least 20, uh, and we'll see if we can do better. But the, the, the good thing of that is that it's very non invasive. It's very non invasive. It's only, it's, a, it's like a typical EMG, surface EMG, but the, the beauty of it is that you have a number of things. So you can do like EEG type of analysis of source localization and separation and so on. So that's the beauty of that. Now a question from the, from the audience. The actual, okay, yes. Well, thank you. Great talk. Many, many things. Very interesting. Mm. Uh, perhaps we ha I have many questions, but I focus on your last uh, model. Yeah. La Diva, I think. La Diva, yes. Um, perhaps it's only an idea. 
it will be interesting try to put some knowledge into this problem of uh, inner voice recognition perhaps this type of model can integrate with the easy data for inner speech and try to mimic uh, this internal voice in this way is perhaps a little ambitious because you didn't have a speech signal there really but you have the activation of the cortex yes. and different parts of the brain and i think that there is a, an interesting opportunity in order to get as we talked yesterday models that use knowledge in order to get solve the problems and not only uh, uh, forced by data only what, what yes yes i i completely agree and um i think I don't know. Yeah, that's what I wrote. Um, I think, and when I saw your talk yesterday, I thought of the same thing. So, so I think La Diva, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity, and it's also an opportunity for what we saw with Humberto in the sense of, of it's a new model for voice control, for pitch control. Um, I would say that the inner speech, it's related to what in La Diva, and I was trying to load this thing up. Hopefully, it would work. Is it working? It's not working. See if it's this. I'll try to get it. In La Diva, uh, yeah. So th this is the Diva model, and in La Diva we have these. Um, this this one here, the feet forward controller. The feet forward is the part of the controller where you're not. You, this is like your your programming model. It's the language model. So you're not producing an output when you do not hear yourself when the the auditory feedback is suppressed. Even if you don't have a way of listening to the sounds you're making, you can still program how the muscles would move and everything you're going to be doing. So all of what I think is inner speech or, or silent speech or the different things you were saying, I think they will be embedded here. Um, so I think it's a great opportunity. And I think this is something that it's a, it's a conversation that would definitely need to involve Frank Gunter, the creator of this model, because it's also articulatory, right? It's not just the tone, right? It, it, it particularly at, at the level of thinking of words, right? It's your tongue, the one that is primarily here doing the job, rather than the larynx. The larynx would control yes. other things, right? Um, so intonation and so stress and so on. So I think I think there's a, a there's a great opportunity there, and probably the data that you're, you're using. Could be used to look at some of this behavior as well. So I think I think there's room there, and I will definitely involve Frank Gunter. Okay, there are some works from some researchers uh, that use that signals in order to control a speech synthesizer. But I think that this type of model it goes far, and yeah. yes, we have to think together. Yeah, absolutely. I so would be delighted. You. Very, very. And we, I have the same uh, EEG that you can observe. Yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you. More questions? Any other question? Okay. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful uh, my question is about the, the, the asymmetric model. Yes. Okay. Jesus. Jesus. Uh, how do you set how do you set the parameters? For this for this was an example. It was an example. It was it was just manual tuning because Jesus just developed this model like very recently, a couple of months ago. So we haven't yet put this model into the exercise of Bayesian estimation of model parameters and so on. He was just tuning by hand and seeing if he could change the activation of the model of the muscles. These are the muscles. Uh, LCA, TA, CT, he was playing with these parameters in order to get something that he would thought he would mimic something like that. So our exercise now is to do this more rigorously in either an optimization framework yes. or in a Bayesian framework and to have data. We have how many videos of muscle tension dysphonia? 20 something? 14 of muscle tension dysphonia? So we have a number of videos that we can look for for value. It's not a large number of videos, but I think we I think it's enough to get an idea of, of the variability 
And from what we have, I think these are the numbers that you got from the 14 videos. Is that right? Oh, for only one page. So, okay. so we can get an idea of a group or subject specific uh, optimization. But that's a that's an ongoing. He was just developing the model, the physics of the asymmetric thing, and now we're going to put it into the blender of estimation. Any other question? No. So we thank Matthias one more time for this wonderful talk. Continuamos entonces con, con la tercera charla del día. So we will be continuing with the third talk of the day, delivered by Gabriel Alzamendi. Gabriel received his degree in biomedical engineering from the Facultad de Ingeniería, Universidad Nacional de Entre Ríos, in 2010. He received a National Scientific and Technical Research, Research Council scholarship for doctoral studies from 2011 to 2016, and obtained his PhD degree in engineering with a mention on machine learning, machine learning, signal, and system theory from Facultad de Ingeniería y Ciencias Hídricas de la Universidad Nacional del Litoral in 2016. He obtained a postdoctoral research position at Facultad de Ingeniería UNER, granted by CONICET from 2016 to 2018, and then he moved to Chile to hold a postdoctoral research position at the Advanced Center for Electrical and Electronic Engineering, Universidad Técnica Santa Maria, from the year 2018 to 2020, under the advice of the Professor Matias Sañarto. After his time in Chile, he returned to Argentina in 2021 to hold an academic position at the Facultad Ingeniería and also a position at CONICET, in CONICET uh, as a, an assistant researcher to join uh, the Institute for Research and Development in Bioengineering and Bioinformatics, IBB, UNER CONICET. So, and finally, his research interests include Bayesian processing, psychological biomechanical modeling, physiological biomechanical modeling, I'm sorry, and inverse problem in biomedical systems with special attention to the clinical assessment of, of human phonation. So now, Gabriel Alzamendi for the third talk of the day. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Marcelo, for the presentations. It's really a pleasure to be here in, at home talking about what I did, what a lot of people together did in last years about this new idea to try to analyze, simulate, imitate, or even assess how the human formation occurs in normal situations, and more importantly, in pathological situations. 
So this is the summary of this talk. And I'm going to start with some very preliminary and basic insights in order to, to take us a, as a, the beginning step to move forward during the, these presentations. Uh, I suppose that this talk will be more easy to deliver and you to, to follow because most of the, the sessions were covered uh, by Matthias. But our idea is principally to play with these two different problems but are, that are very, very connected. First of all, the physiological modeling. And the other related problem is the inverse problem and how one help us to uh, obtain improvement in the other. When we, when we think about physiological modeling, we try to mimic all the, the different processes that occurs in living organs or living beings. So the idea is to try to explain, to represent, to put in different uh, physical laws or mathematical system all what uh, we see or we know about these living processes. So thinking about this forward, uh, method before our path, we have this representation, these theoretical representations that had a lot of properties, parameters. We can change all these parameters that will be the causes that we have the interest to analyze or to to, to see what, what effects produce. Then run simulations and see what happened with data with data. So so from causes we can analyze the effects of changing these different parameters. On the other hand, we can obtain the data, see what the, the reality show us, what can uh, learn about the, 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 the physiological data, and then try to see in the model what are the causes that uh, give rise to this solution, to these uh, effects that we see in real in the in reality. Sorry. So this new idea is what a given inverse problem try to solve to start with data, with real data, and then given the model, try to explain what are the effects, what are the causes that produce that effects. Yes? So first of all, we are very interested in physiological models. But are these physiological models useful? And why are they, useful? Are they so useful? Luckily, after Matthias' talk, this, this is easy to answer. In very aspect so when we have model we also have knowledge so we can play with what we know about something so we can play with changing parameters change different conditions even i don't know we can use different mathematical tools to try to explain the same situation so different tools maybe can give us different answers so we can produce a lot of new knowledge or even reinforce the knowledge of, that we obtain from different sources. Obviously, when we try to synthesize something, to try to imitate something, we uh, can improve our knowledge. And also, this idea to play with a, a tool has uh, give us the opportunity to, I don't know, to, to see what's happening in very typical situation, even in fictional situation, for example, how a person could phonate in another planet, but more importantly, what happened in pathological situations? That in general, we think that pathological situations are extreme situations in a model, but sometimes, as Matthias told, a, a normal patient, a typical patient, or a patient with a typical phonation, sometimes talk like a normal patient, sometimes like a pathological patient. So these cases that we say that will be odd cases, sometimes are more natural, more common that we really think. And also, we can play with different parts of a given bigger system. So sometimes giving an improvement on a specific part can have a lot to understand what's happening in other parts of a, of a given system. So these are different, uh, uh, different ways to how can we analyze a given problem, in particular a physiological problem, and try to attack or tackle the difficulties using different uh, tools? In the case of inverse problems, or phonation in particular, 
a su Matías Tolas, we have a lot of data that we can see from a patient. And more and more, uh, and every year, uh, this kind of data are more and more um, available for us. So the idea is to use this data and try to obtain as much information as we can. But what is most important is not only what we can see, but also what we cannot observe or we cannot sense. So if we have a model that explains the process like a foundation, we can see or try to obtain from this observed measure, observed signals, what is happening in the internal part, in the latent part of our models. So again, it's a process that is based in a model, in a simplified explanation, but it can give us some internal information, some hidden information that otherwise would be impossible to observe or to obtain. Yes? So our aim as a group is to obtain insights about the, fit, the pathophysiology of human formation, but the, we want that these new insights were useful to solve relevant problems in the clinical assessment, assessment of formation. In particular, in this task, the idea is to describe past and uh, present, present effort that we were, we were involved in the last five years, and also we hope that this discussion sparked some discussions and some collaborations with other colleagues here in Argentina or other places in the world. So now I'm going to briefly introduce some different efforts that we we do in, we did in the last year, starting with the structural analysis of peak period sequences. So for example, we have this signal that is the representation of the sounds of a vowel A. And when we hear the vowel, it seems like a very stable sound. But when we analyze in detail these sounds, sometimes we can estimate different parameters describing some perturbations. For example, if we detect how periodic the signal is, we can uh, sense this kind of period for every cycle. But when we display how this period evolves a long time, we see that it's not constant. It's changing uh, with time. So having this information, we can try to obtain mass information, much more information. Uh, but that if this information will be sometimes useful to explain what's happening inside the signal. So what other people do in the past is to use what's called perturbation analysis of the period sequences. However, this perturbation analysis in the past uh, falls with it from false because the, this idea did not take into account that there are some important information in the data that we can describe easily. For example, we can see the broad motion of the signal, that there is some kind of fluctuations, or also that we have in a very small piece of signal, like a perturbations. So this is this very easy to describe, but not that easy to explain with classical instruments. So with this is very brief description, we propose what we call the structural representation of the period sequence, and we try to explain this analysis into a Bayesian formalism. So with this mathematical framework, we have the opportunity to not only explain what is happening, but also to analyze the signal and obtain this kind of information uh, for every real-time signal. So the idea was quite simple. We have these three different phenomena. One, vocal profile that give us the, the slow motion in the signal, something that describes the fluctuations, oscillations, and the, in the last part that try to explain this perturbation, this local perturbation in very, very near scale. 
So we take this idea to uh, then put them into a patient estimator. In particular, we use Kalman filter and smoother. Also, the Bayesian formalism allows us to obtain a optimization framework that allows us to obtain the, the better fit for our data, for every real life data. And then after we obtain this distress model, we can estimate, we can separate the, all the information that we want from a given period sequence. So here you have an example for a healthy power um, period sequence. So you can see here at the top in gray, the original period sequence. And then you can see the estimation that we obtain from this vocal trend for the cyclic or the fluctuations and then for the perturbations. Luckily, the same tool worked for pathological cases. So, so the, the model was general enough to be useful to describe similar situation, both in healthy and pathological cases. So we use this tool in this data set with pathological and normal cases. And we not only analyze how this, uh, this structural analysis, so sorry, this structural element evolving time, but also how fast they change using the discrete difference of these signals. So we can see that for the case of these changes in time, all these parameters were very useful to try to separate or to describe what's happening in normal and what's happening in pathological cases. We can see that for the structural elements alone, this differential is not that evident. So, uh, also, we try to compare this idea with some tools for the, for the classical methods. In particular, one useful acoustic parameter called Jitter uh, is, was, is one of the most applied uh, values to try to measure uh, period perturbance in the, in the balls, in particular in the sustained powers. So we try to see these new tools, how compare with these classical, classical parameters. So we run different uh, correlations analysis, and we see that the most strong correlation was with the cycle component, not with the trend, with, uh, neither with the perturbation component. Therefore, we have a new, a new uh, proposed uh, element that fits to the, this classical parameter called jitter. However, we also have two other new information that do not correlate well with this uh, parameter. Therefore, there are new information or more information that we can obtain uh, from these new, these new signals. Uh, one more thing that you can see is that from a given real life signal, the, the voice, we can obtain another different signal that are all, that are all are, sorry, all artificial, are made by the men. See, we cannot measure, but we can build it, right? So the next uh, idea to describe involves the voice inverse filter. Again, the notion of inverse something, inverse some system or some processes. The idea here is, roughly speaking, when we produce a sound, we uh, we change the flow, the airflow, uh, crossing through the to the glottis. We modify this this airflow in the vocal tract, and then we radiate the sound through the lips. This is the physiological point of view of phonation. However, we can summarize this process using only two elements: what is called the glottal function and the vocal tract. Uh, doing that, we can even uh, simplify the, the, all these cases and think in that we have a current source and a filter. So we can apply uh, mathematical, uh, classical mathematical theory. But with this, uh, this simple representation, we are able to reproduce and simulate sounds. However, the other question is, given 
uh, measured or sense signal. What can I say about the source and then filter that produce that sound? So the idea of solving this problem is what is called the voice inverse filtering. The idea, the idea here is to obtain from the given signal, for a given voice signal, the two components that produce this signal as a result. So I want to introduce briefly two different ideas. The first one was a proposal uh, in my PhD thesis. The idea was to apply Bayesian inference to solve this problem. For that, we made some assumptions. For example, the glottal formation in for the production of power are quasi-periodic signals, and also that the vocal tract is a dynamic system, but with a very slow variation, slow with respect to the glottal flow. So using these two hypotheses and the mathematical tool called time variable autoregressive model with external input, we build a state space method and put all this information into a patient processor called Kalman filter. To do, uh, as a result of all this, we are able to obtain how the vocal tract changes, in particular, how this coefficient that describes the vocal tract changes with time, and also an estimate of the glottal function. So here we have, uh, we can see some examples, some artificial examples. Here on the top, you can see two different signals, one from a vowel A and another from a vowel E. And you can see there in the second row, the estimate of that got a function that I, I told before. Then integrating this signal, we can obtain the glottal airflow because the lip radiation can be modeled easy by a differentiation in time. So to go from this signal to this one, to the glottal airflow, we need to integrate the information. And finally, in the last row, we can see the spectral representation of this vocal track filter. The more important thing that we can try to see in this, in this kind of representation is the position of these peaks that correspond to the form and frequency in the vocal track. So uh, these in blue lines are the result with our method, that in red, I think that is very difficult to see, but the other result with another classical method called uh, EIF. And in black is the theoretical information that was obtained with a physiological model. So we can see that the results obtained were quite well, uh, even in the same, even improving this classical method. And we try to measure how well uh, our method, with, uh, how well our method results with this physical IIF method. So we compare the error in the estimation of the glottal flow. And we can see that in general, our method provides a, a small error compared with the classical method. And also, this is for the glottal formation, but the other part of the problem was the vocal tract. So we also estimate how well our method estimate the, the position of the foreman, and we compare it with the classical method IAF and LP. This LP is the classical linear prediction method that is not that good for inverse filtering's problem, but for the estimation of water format, is a classical tool. Here we can see that in general, both our method and IAF improve classical LP method, but in some situation our method provide better results than this IAF method. And as I tell you, we try to build a dynamic model. So here we can see a dynamic process. This is the change from a, an A vowel to an A vowel. And we can see that our model is able to follow the most important thing is able to follow how the first format, this line, and the second format how they evolve a long time. Yes. The second method is a 
actually the work of our PhD student, Ivan Salazar. This is the, a brand new result that he published, sorry, he presented in a conference in Chile two weeks ago. You can see that we use a very similar model. In this case, in this case we use the autoregressive model. And even we know that linear prediction is very classical and very easy and very powerful. However, it has a lot of limitation when we try to apply it for reverse filtering. There are other uh, alternatives to solve this problem. One of the most uh, um, more classical is provide a close phase linear prediction analysis. That means that use the information only during the close phase to apply linear prediction. We, when we do that, we obtain a very, very good result for the inverse filter. However, the estimation of the closed phase, that is the moment of the formation when the lotus is closed, is very difficult. So we try to obtain a method that has the same potential, that closed phase analysis, but without the need to know when the, the, the lotus is closed. So Ivan had this amazing idea to use for entropy criterion to try to solve this problem. So they, uh, he combined weight linear prediction with iterative computation and they obtained a very good tool. So the idea was to, uh, instead of try to maxi to minimize the, the root mean root squared error, they, tried, they choose to maximize this new optimization problem. This here is a core entropy nucleo, a core entropy kernel, sorry, six, a core entropy kernel. And when solved this problem, he obtained a very easy solution that involved this kind of matrix multiplication. And also as a result, he obtained a weighted function. However, the, the good thing of this weighting function is when the e parameter goes to infinity, this weighting function goes to zero. What tell this to us? When the error is very, very uh, big, then the weighting, how much, in, how much information we can obtain from this, this sample is very low. In the practice, here we can see the the evolution of the solution according to the method. Here is the very first iteration. In blue, you can see the, the weight, the weighting function, see how important these samples are for our methods. Here, in the second row, is the error in the estimation of, uh, of our, in the, sorry, in this variable, this error. And finally, you can see the result, the total function obtained as as a result of this iteration. So after some iteration, we can see that the weighting is changing, paying more attention to some part of the signal and giving zero information, zero weight to a specific, a specific part of the signal. After a long, long uh, iteration, we can see that the method uh, only guided by the data, guided by data focus in particular part of the signal, and this gives us very, very improvements in the estimation of the total function. So Ivan compared his result with other methods, some one classic like linear prediction and some right new like a quasi close phase prediction and a, a statistical method, probability weight, sorry, linear prediction, and we can see that in general, uh, the proposed method improved the result compared with others. You can see our method in the blue color. In particular, look at the difference between the classical linear prediction and how the other methods in, try to improve this uh, technique. And also the result obtained were uh, in particular very good and as good as some other results 
recently published in the literature. Here you can see some examples for artificial signal. So we can see in particular how the total airflow is estimated. And the detail that tells us that the solution is quite good is that we obtain a flat response in this part of the signal corresponding to the closed phase. For example, if you see the solution for a linear prediction, you see this kind of oscillation or fluctuations. And the other method, in particular ours, try to provide a most flat solution in this part of the of the signal. Also, we can see that even when overall the position of the format are quite similar, the change in the wave around the peak that is called the wave band, sorry, the, the wave band, uh, change, uh, change a little uh, between this method. So this specific tuning is what asks us to obtain a better solution, right? Okay, this cases was introduced before by Matthias. So the idea is almost the same. Even uh, instead of trying to only estimate the total function, we are now interested on estimating more information about the phonation, in particular about the vocal function. Not only a signal, but also parameters, also uh, internal variables, something like that. And for that, we are going to use data obtained from clinic. Uh, Matthias showed recently how to, for example, obtain video or how to obtain flow for in clinical settings. So the proposed method was to obtain clinical data, uh, applying vision processing and also biomedical signals but based all solution into a given physiological mode. Although that, we consider a biomechanical model of the local force, in particular the so-called body cover model that allows us to describe how the vocal force oscillate. But also we connect this uh, virtual vocal force with vocal track above and below the, the larynx, the, sorry, the, the glottis. And this is what we call the interaction between flow, acoustic, and tissue. And then we use uh, some rules in order to control this model using something like uh, muscle activation, in particular for CT and the muscles, and also subglottal pressure. We did that because these are more, the more physiological ways to control a, uh, a given system, physiological system, muscles and pressure. And also, we try to explain, when analyze how these vocal folds collide when the vocal folds uh, contact each other. So we put all this information into a state space model, in particular a nonlinear state space model. And as observation, we analyze two different cases. Uh, a cases that is that include that only is available observation of the glutal area, how the the, the glottis changed uh, during the vocal fold oscillations, and another situation more complex that use glottal area and also estimation of flow obtained with the Rottenberg mass. As you can see, here we have much more information than in these simple cases. And to solve the problem, we use the well known extended camera filter that is a good uh, vision processor suitable for nonlinear models. So here we can see some examples. In the first row, we have the how the area evolves with time. In the second row, we can see how the measure flow is evolved with time. Okay. Just for giving you another information, what we sense with the mouse is what is called the oral flow, the flow in the mouth. But what we really know, or what really interested at, is the flow at the glottis. So to to move from flow at the mouth to flow at the at the glottis, we need to use another reverse problem. 
So what you can see here is the solution of this inverse problem that provide information at the glottis, how the flow is crossing through the glottis. These two informations separate the two different cases we analyze. The first case, we only have this information, and the second case that we, we solve is combining these two information in a single model. Here we can see the estimate that we obtain for subglottal pressure and for contact pressure. As we can see, the red solution is when using only glottal area, and blue solution is when we combine flow and uh, subglottal pressure. What we see in this case is that when we combine suitably these two kinds of information that we can obtain from a given subset, the solutions were more stable and more physiologically relevant. Here is the, the experiment that Matthias described. The idea is to uh, say pa, 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 repetitively and to measure how the pressure in the mouth changes when the, the mouth is, is closed and when you say ah. When the mouth is closed, you can see that the pressure try to, to be similar or almost equal to the other pressure. And when you say ah, the measured pressure goes down, but you obtain sounds. So when you extrapolate, sorry, when you interpolate these two peaks, you can obtain something like the phonation pressure. So again, in red, we have the solution using only glottal area. In blue, we have the solution with the combination of glottal and flow, uh, sorry, glottal area and flow. So this is the result that Matthias delayed. Obviously, they are quite wrong, but you need to, to understand that here we have much more information, information that combine not only the biomechanics, but also aerodynamics. So the solution of thing in this second case is much more relevant, much more accurate. And this is why the, the idea of the video is also very interesting for us, because we can try to move this bad solution to something more readable, but using some kind of constraint or more information, for, sorry, or adding more information in our model. So the last application is what Matthias also present in his talk. It's about this idea of the muscle control physiological model of phonation. So the idea was to obtain a quite simple computational model, but that we able to describe with enough detail the complex process involving phonation. So this model has several parts, in particular have the simplified representation of the larynx that combine not only the oscillation of the vocal fold, but also the geometry of the glottis and also physical coping. In particular for us, it's very important to describe as accurate as possible this preferred interaction of the glottis, how the acoustic pressure and, and tissue uh, coupling or interact during the phonation. Uh, and also try to represent how the sound propagates uh, above and below the glottis and also how the, the sound is radiated at the, at the middle. So let's try to see a little more about the simplified representation of the larynx. Here you can see what we really know about the larynx, about the anatomy, about the physiology, how, how is the internal structure of every vocal force and how these vocal force uh, evolve during a given vocal force oscillation. We can see that this system follow a waving motion from uh, bottom to top. So in order to mimic this same physiological and anatomical information, we uh, construct a biomechanical model. The, the triangular body cover model was proposed by a former student of Matthias in 2017 or 18. And in this opportunity, we add a new uh, strategy to control the shape of the glottis. And how to, uh, 
to apply a dynamic system to simulate all this uh, glottal accommodation, changes in the glottal flow using uh, muscle control by the intrinsic muscles. So we obtain a system that allows to control all the process using the five intrinsic muscles and also that the system is able to change the internal properties of the vocal force. So changing the muscle activation, we are able to change the shape of the glottis but also the internal mechanical properties of the vocal force. So uh, this problem was solved in two steps. In the first step, we try to simulate how the how was the slow motion of the glottis in order to, to accommodate the, the shape in the performatory moment, and then to set the biomechanical properties of the vocal folds in order to start the vocal fold oscillation. So we run a lot of simulations. For example, we were able to describe how the, the arytenoid, that is a cartilage, cartilage responsible of the, the geometry of the, the glottis, move with the changes in the activation of the five intrinsic muscles. So this but this uh, artificial cartilage was, uh, was allowed to move and to rotate in order to obtain different uh, glottal shapes. And also we describe in different cases of co-contraction how the internal variables of the glottis change. For example, the, the formation of the vocal folds, how they strain uh, due to different cases of co-contractions and also how the the horizontal displacement of the vocal process that is the tip in the cartilage move, given different co-contraction in the muscles. Then we try to simulate the phonation. In particular, we simulate in several vowels to see how, again, the changing the, the muscles allows us to control the phonation and how also changing other parts in the system interact or uh, couple the oscillation of the vocal force. We can see that changing the shape of the vocal tract has an important effect on changing how the vocal force oscillates. Here you can see map describing the fundamental frequency that is the frequency of oscillations and you can see that in some cases the fundamental frequency goes very up and in some other cases goes very down. So it depends in different uh, situations depending not only on the muscular activation but also the in the Muscular action, Mus muscle, sorry, muscle activation. So we close and open the, the, the glottal muscles, and if we can analyze how this change the glottal area, how this change the glottal flow, the acoustic pressure, and we can see this in time and also in frequency. So we can obtain all kind of uh, simulated effects, analyzing different situations, both in time domain and in frequency domain. So, as a summary, we are very interested in investigating the human phonation, in particular, considering uh, both dynamic and pathophysiology. Also, we are interested in this constructive or positive cycle about modeling and sensing, how the model allows us to improve the sensing and how they obtain new information allows also to improve the, the different models. Uh, uh, by making better or more physiological relevant models, we were able to obtain more information about the foundation. Again, we use the model as a reference, but now we can talk about 
blood pressures, contact pressure, and muscle activations that without uh, the physiological model, that would be more, much more difficult. And also, you can see that we, he, we have here a lot of signals that we need to, to understand, we need to process. So using different tools allows us to send much and more information. And, and all this information together can guide us to obtain better models. However, we have a lot of open problems to, to, to talk about or to, to, to start collaborations. First of all, the clinical validation. In order to, to, to be sure that what the, the solutions, sorry, that the solution that we obtain are what we, is really happening in the real life situations. But for do that, we need a lot of clinical data that was obtained with a very precise, uh, with very precise tool, with very precise protocols in order to, to have, uh, to are confident that this information is accurate enough. Also, we need methods that allow us to combine different sources of information. For example, combine it all at once or using different stages of processing, uh, adding more and more information. Uh, this uh, is related to what, what Matthias talked recently, the difference between in clinic or in lab versus in field situations, the situations are completely different, and also how to calibrate some signals, because we know that we can measure, for example, high-speed video is very good, but we lost the, the geometrical information in the, in, the, in the images. The same, of course, with, for example, when we pick the, the sound pressure with the microphone, we, do, we do not know the physical units, we only can see the, the changes in the, in the signal. So these are a lot of open problems that we need to discuss and work uh, in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this work was granted by Argentinian and Chilean institution, and also for NIH, and principally this workshop was uh, granted by Stigam Suit Project that we obtain with Chilean, Brazilian, and French collaborators. So, thank you very much. So, thank you very much, Gabriel, for your great talk. Uh, if you, if uh, we have uh, questions from the audience, yes, Joaquin. Hello, uh, Thank you for the talk. A very specific question. In the voice impulse filtering, how do you determine the model order of the autoregressive model you use for the Good question. There are some very basic rules due to the sample frequency. Mm -hmm. For example, for a sample frequency of 8K, 8 kilohertz, you can choose a model around 8 to 14. But in general, you need to see the, the solutions and change it uh, as you wish. In general, still it's, we have not uh, an accurate method to, to accurately say that the solution is good enough or not. The model is something that you need to choose a priori. More questions? Yeah. <coughs> Question is about, can you do the slide very quick? Yes. Can you update about what is the reason of the sublocal pressure growing up in this, in this region? Not entirely, but our model has some kind of adaptations because it's a dynamical model. And also, we see that also the sensor has this kind of delay. So it seems like that the, the coupling has some effect in the solutions. But this is only a, a, a first idea. We need to explore this in more detail. So, we, so you're saying that it's really into the model? Or? 
least for the physics itself, the model in Mathematica. In my model. opinion, is because the model. Because in my the opinion. Mathematica model. Yes. I, oh, model. For example, I would want a more standard solution, like something like that. So I don't know if this uh, variation, this uh, per perturbation in the solution, is the, uh, I don't know exactly the how the, da the data uh, is in reality to, yeah, yeah. to guarantee that this is due to the, the data. The real data that I'm able to measure, the assumption is that all the central operation in this specific local gesture is constant. It's actually it's constant. So it's we are showing the, the model that this is not constant. No. Uh, and also, you can see these initial transits yeah. that are also are not good, but at the middle, you can see that the solution is treated or is in the same order that the peaks uh, around the estimation. Okay. You're welcome. Can, can I add something to that? Yeah. Yes. Just sure. when we're measuring here, estimating is a lot of pressure, not a lot of pressure. Because a lot of pressure can have an effect associated with, with interactions. So there, there could be some unsteady effects associated with that, but that's not the long pressure. The long pressure is supposed to be constant, right? But we don't know really, as Gabby said, we don't know because yeah, we you know we cannot really measure that. I mean there's a way to do it, but we haven't done that. We swallow a balloon, you inflate the balloon and you estimate the changes of the balloon. And that's how you get a signal that Area across time, but it's, it's not, we haven't done that. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel, for this presentation. I think there is a lot of different approaches. Uh, I have to ask you about, you use uh, some of your models you contrast your your results with LPC that is classical. Oh yes, more more. You are talking about uh, this possible filtering. Yes, but uh, some years ago, some colleagues proposed a sparse uh, LPC. Yes, that they showed the uh, it is it has a better uh, resolution for common tracker all of that. Is the the same LPC but with the regularization term. Uh, the L01 norm over the coefficients. Yeah. I think you are talking about the work of D'Agostino. I don't like. remember. But yes, but yes. Uh, as far as we see, this trans this type of solution is for uh, for an estimation yes. in particular. In particular, for inverse filtering, the is not how can you say? It's part of the solution, the estimation of, of the focal filter. Um, for example, on, when you apply this kind of uh, revolution, regularization, sorry, in your problem, you will use all the information in the all the information available in the signal. However, the most recent uh, ideas in inverse filtering of the voice pay attention to the closed face because in that part we more readable about the information of the vocal tract and try to avoid the part that we can see more present of the source excitation. So doing that, that waiting, you obtain a better representation of the global flow. That is what at least we want. So in particular, I don't remember that any author used this uh, num uh, sparse linear prediction to obtain better estimation of the global flow. But as you say, you obtain a very, very robust estimation of the yeah, local okay. tract. Okay. And uh, what about some other new methods for the site of artificial, artificial intelligence? I remember a work of Prasada. Very good question. Yes. yes. We are interested in using this GAM network or some deep learning techniques to try to tackle this problem, but the most important problem is to obtain how to the, the signal to train the, the the net in particular for artificial signal it's quite easy to obtain different kind of simulation however for real real time cases the, the, there's still not enough 
accuracy and not enough information to obtain an accurate net. So for the moment, I, we think that obtain a better system that allows us to obtain relevant information about the data flows will allow us in the future to train and prove this kind of system that I, I con I'm confident that will be much better and much faster than this. And perhaps uh, we have to fuse both idea yeah. knowledge sure. base and again a database approach to, mm -hmm. to get a better uh, solution. Yes, 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 yes. That's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? No? Okay, if we do not have any more questions, then we can thank Gabriel again. Now, now we're having a coffee break and we will be resuming at 4.30 p.m. Okay. Ahora cortamos hasta las 4 y media de la tarde cuando arranca la última charla del día. Gracias. <laughs>